Uh, like I said, my name is Mark Ty. I'm from the University of Minnesota, and I also come from the zebrafish husbandry world. Um, not quite as large of a facility as Chris's. Uh, he has hundreds of racks, whereas I have about 20, uh, perhaps a little bit more representative of what a large majority of the researchers um, have as far as facilities. Uh, also a former president of the Zebrafish Husbandry Association. So, um, so for those of you who don't know much about zebrafish, this is what normal zebrafish look like when they are developing. Uh, within the first day, uh, up on top, the top two pictures are developing within the first day or so. Uh, pictures B and B1, that's about 24 hours. And then at C, that's about probably four or five days uh, based on their gas bladder inflation, which is indicated by the arrow there. Uh, but at my facility around June of 2016, we started seeing fish like this. And this is not photo enhanced, this is an actual image of what we would see. Uh, obviously a very distinct orange color in these fish. At first we thought it would, maybe it was a carotenoid issue. Um, we tested that, we actually found that carotenoids in this diet that we were feeding was actually less than previous, so that ruled that out. Um, but we were seeing a lot of issues, including a uh, lack of inflation of the swim bladder, as you can see in the F, they just did not inflate their swim bladder. We're seeing very high mortalities at about seven or eight days post fertilization about 90 to 100% mortality, which is a big deal for my facility. Uh, normally we'd see about 20% mortality at that stage. Um, so it was really affecting all of my researchers because they could not get embryos past the seven or eight day uh, period. Uh, obviously it had a dramatic color change and this occurred in all of our genetic lines throughout our facility. And this occurred right after we changed to uh, a new batch of feed. Right? It was the same type of feed, but it was a new batch of feed. Uh, very poor larval health, I mentioned that earlier, uh, but no effects were observed in our adult fish. Um, long story short, we found that the, our feed was contaminated with chromium. We weren't sure if it was trivalent or hexavalent chromium, um, <coughs> but we found it was chromium nonetheless. And it's worth noting that similar symptoms were found at another facility using the same feed uh, shortly after they started a new batch of this exact same feed, and that was at the University of Utah. And when I talk about uh, poor larval health, these are actually pictures from our facility, we're talking about severe cardiac edema, uh, misshapen yolk sacs. We would also see yolk rupture after about two or three days on some of them. Uh, probably 80 to 90 percent of them would not inflate their swim bladder, which caused a lot of issues in behavior. One of my PIs does behavior, early larval behavioral studies, uh, and pretty much 90 to 100 percent mortality by seven or eight days. Um, and it's worth noting that we did find a paper that um, found that there was a maternal transfer of chromium from the adults to the ova in Madaka. Nothing could be found about zebrafish. And so what we think happened is that we were feeding these adults this contaminated diet. They, it was not enough or a high enough concentration to affect the adults, at least not noticeable to us, and, but it was transferred into the ova and it affected the development of our young fish. Now, this is obviously a very extreme case of toxicity, but what about if the toxic levels were much lower and it was only affecting a certain pathway or a certain uh, genetic expression in certain genes, or if it only affected the liver, maybe we wouldn't notice those things. But I hate to say it, but luckily, we know it was very extreme, so we could catch it right away. Um, and so we, to evaluate this, we evaluate, we sent our diet in to be analyzed for heavy metals. And we got a number. We said, we found out that there were 70 milligrams per kilogram of chromium in our diet. Okay. And that seems like a really big number. But in reality, that means absolutely nothing. Because we have absolutely nothing to refer, to reference back to saying, this amount in our diet is bad. So we got a number. So we went back and we tested several other common zebra fish diets because that's all we could do. And we tested, so we fed non-hatching decapsulated brine shrimp cysts. Um, we just fed the decaps right to our, to our fish. We didn't have to hatch them, but we tested several other types of cysts as well as you know, micro and Ziegler, um, tested rotifers as well. And they were all very low. And we found that our chromium in this particular diet was I think 30 or 40 times higher than all those diets. So that also led us to believe that, okay, it's probably bad. Uh, reference back to this. This was a bad food, right? This, I can definitely say that, or at least a bad batch. Um, 
but we have nothing to go back to and say, okay, at 10 milligrams per kilogram, that is unacceptable. That affects certain aspects of development. We had nothing like that. Most of the toxicology, uh, there's a lot of toxicology involving heavy metals, but it's all about exposure of young fish to this metal in the water. Nothing done about consumption. Okay, two totally different modes of bringing these toxins into the body. So that brings up two fundamental questions. Uh, what toxins and contaminants should we be concerned about in our zebra fish diet? And two, what concentration is acceptable, right? Because we're always, gonna, if we're going to test for, let's say, arsenic in our diet, most likely there's going to be a trace amount in But at what level is acceptable for the type of research that we're doing? So to address the first question, you know, what should be of concern? Essentially, it should be any compound that is plausible to enter our feeds, and it could affect research, whether this be coming from certain ingredients that are put in there, the processing method, or perhaps storage. And we talked about rancid oils in the past, where if we expose some of these oils to oxygen, that oil becomes rancid. Um, and so in general, we don't really think of chromium as being a potential contaminant to aquaculture feeds. So it just goes to show you that just about anything can happen and we should broaden our search a little bit uh, as to what could happen to these feeds. So just to give you an example, and I'm not gonna go ever over every possibility here because I only have 10 minutes. I'm not like Chris and take 30 minutes on a 15 minutes presentation. <laughs> yeah. Um, but arsenic may be a concern. Because, you know, it's plausible because it does exist in certain uh, aquatic animals and plants as well as rice, which may be an ingredient. Um, very carcinogenic, has developmental defects as well in many species. In zebrafish in particular, uh, it's been known to have neurological issues as well as affect locomotive activity. And again, most of these studies that I'm going to be referencing uh, refer to exposing these fish to compounds in the water, not consumption. And also in rainbow trout, it's known to affect the inflation of the gallbladder. It's much different than uh, because chromium uh, obviously is concerned to me, and it does occur it, to some degree in aquatic animals. However, not to the extent that we found in our feed. Uh, in the research that I found in natural diets, like they do uh, aquatic invertebrate sampling, they'll find it maybe three or four milligrams per kilogram, but not seventy. Okay, so it does exist to some degree, but is that amount acceptable? You know, we don't know yet. Uh, it's very carcinogenic and had caused certain developmental defects. In zebrafish in particular, it's been known to be neurotoxic and interfere with certain metabolic activity. Um, mercury also accumulates in aquatic animals. Uh, it causes all sorts of developmental defects. In zebrafish, it's been known to alter swimming behavior and prey capture, which is of interest to my group because I have a PI that takes up most of my room that does a lot of those things. Uh, Atlantic salmon, it's been known to cause oxidative stress, amongst other things. Another category may be persistent organic pollutants. Perhaps the most infamous is DDT, which has been outlawed in the United States for at least 30 years and almost every country in the world, but it still persists in the environment. Every once in a while, you will see a news article saying that certain dog chow is, sorry, not chow, dog food, is, um, has, been, has, has some DDT detected in it, or maybe a chicken, or maybe some eggs have been found with DDT residue in it. Uh, so it is definitely possible that it could enter our aquatic food. <laughs> Toxaphene is what has replaced DDT. Uh, it's also very common, used on soybeans, corn, wheat, also accumulates in aquatic animals. Uh, in Madaka, it's been known to alter certain gene expressions, uh, especially in genes involved with metabolism and protein regulation. Glyphosate, also known as Roundup, everybody knows that. It's probably the most common herbicide applied, at least in the United States. Um, and in zebrafish, it's known to be toxic to the forebrain and midbrain, as well as call, cause certain developmental defects. Another category would be antimetabolites, and some of the nutrition guys would know a little bit more about this, but uh, trypsin inhibitor is very common in soybeans in relatively high amounts and has been known to cause growth defect, or not growth defects, but decrease the growth in many multiple, multiple species. Um, phytic acid also occurs in soybeans, rapeseed, and cottonseed. And in salmon, it's been known to uh, depress thyroid function. So that would be a big deal if you're involving the thyroid um, in your research. Uh, also increases the amount of cataracts. There has been a, a breakout, I believe it was in the 80s, which led to this, to this research, 
uh, where they had an uh, extensive outbreak of cataracts in salmon. Uh, one of my PIs does uh, eye development research, and that would be very much of concern to her. Uh, phytoestrogens, uh, since we are starting to see more um, plants involved in our aquatic diets due to uh, the availability of fish meal and the quality of fish meal and availability of fish oils as well, uh, we'll see just and we'll see an increase in soy products and wheat and corn in our uh, feeds in the future. Uh, genistein is one of those phytoestrogens that is in soy products. It's been documented to be up to 229 micrograms per gram in some soy products. Um, and in zebra fish, it's been known to induce apoptosis in certain parts of the brain, uh, as well as affect uh, certain expressions of certain genes. Biocannon A is also another typical uh, phytoestrogen. Uh, it's found in many different plants. Uh, zebra fish, it's been known to skew sex ratios, which as a manager would alter what I'm going to be doing in the facility. If I'm trying to get more females or males for a particular PI, that would affect me. Also alters uh, the behavior of certain mutants. Uh, this particular study was done on a mutant that's used to simulate autism. It's actually been known to uh, revert some of those autistic behaviors. And so that makes that model very difficult to use for that. If there's a <coughs> or a certain amount of biocannabinoid. Uh, mycotoxins uh, coming from fungi or bacteria, such as AFB1, which I believe there was a breakout in the mid-90s or late 90s. With AFB1, it affected, I think it was the trout in the salmon industry. Um, ochratoxin, and that's, very car that's quite carcinogenic as well. Ochratoxin B1 is, uh, comes from a couple different fungi that I'm not going to try to pronounce their names. Uh, but it's a hepatotoxin and it's been known to act as an immune suppressant as well. So this is mostly involving ingredient storage and after this food is processed, how it's stored as well after that. So those are things to be concerned about as well. And there are many other mycotoxins as well. Other things of concern may be glucosinolates, which occurs in rat rape seeds, uh, oxidized fats, which we mentioned earlier. Obviously, if we expose this fish oil to oxygen, uh, it's going to lead to certain vitamin deficiencies, which I think Frosty talked about earlier. Um, and then also non-nutritive additives such as hormones, antibiotics, uh, antioxidants. Uh, they can be applied to certain aquatic um, feeds, which makes sense in the aquaculture world because you want our salmon to be healthy, so we put some antibiotics in there. But we obviously don't want that in our zebrafish feed. So just because we're buying feed or using feed from the aquaculture industry doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be best for us. Uh, and I put this up here because I feed my dog old right. And it was interesting to know that they a couple of years ago they found some a euthanasia drug in some of their dog products, some of their dog food products, uh, because they used uh, pig carcasses or pig meal of some sort, and the euthanasia drug that they used to euthanize those pigs was still present in some of those animals. So just goes to show you that even in the dog food industry that these things do occur and we have to somehow figure out when they occur, document it, and uh, know what is acceptable in our diets and what's not. So that brings us to the second question, you know, what should be acceptable? Uh, the EU does have some regulation as to what should be in their animal feeds. Most of this is in concern because they don't want these compounds getting into the human food chain. Okay. So our, we're coming from a little bit different aspect, but it is a good place to start, at least. Um, they do cover some of the compounds that I talked about, but not all of them. Um, so basically, we need to find out more information. What, what are some of these, like in, in my instance, obvious that there is some sort of contamination that affected our fish, very lethal. But there are so many other sublethal effects that are gonna affect the research and the reproducibility of our research. So we need to start researching some of these things. Obviously, we can't do that all in one shot and that will most likely be a continuous process, but we have to get started nonetheless. So sublethal effects, we're talking about growth and reproduction, which is a basic um, aspect of most aquaculture nutrition studies. So we do have some background in that stuff, but we need to get a little bit more in depth. We need to talk, we're going to be talking about embryo and larval development, you know, where, whether it be swim bladder inflation or certain abnormalities such as spinal deformities or edema. So if these compounds are, you know, increasing the amounts of edema, obviously we want to know that. 
Uh, we also should probably look at certain behavior, including larva and adult behavior. Uh, the, as the carcinogenicity of certain compounds as well, as well as analyzing whole body concentrations of zebrafish. So if we can get, uh, you know, we feed a fish a certain compound that is toxic, we can somehow quantify how it concentrates in their body, then maybe we can kind of relate that to what's already been done in toxicity models, right? So most of these toxicity studies have been done by exposure of these animals to this compound, not necessarily consumption. So that may be a way to kind of bridge the gap between those two aspects. Um, also, we don't want to get a lot more detail, including certain immune response effects, as well as uh, the accumulation in certain tissues, such as the liver or the heart or the brain. Obviously, some of these compounds are going to accumulate more in the lipids or perhaps in the liver or perhaps in the muscle tissue. So we would want to know that as well. As well as certain apoptosis of certain cell types uh, and specific tissue concentrations and even uh, specific gene expression. Because okay? that's most of us do some sort of gene expression work. Um, and if a diet is increasing or decreasing the gene expression of my particular gene I'm studying, that's obviously going to be a concern to me as well. So in, in summary, toxins and contaminants can exist in fish feeds. Uh, it's just a matter of what extent is acceptable. Okay? Um, so we need more research on how uh, these compounds are going to affect our fish, because we know absolutely nothing as far as consumption is concerned. So what's specifically affected and what concentration should we be concerned about? Once that is done, then we can talk to uh, other people and talk to PIs about, okay, if this compound exists in your feed, this is how your research is going to be affected, right? Get them on board or more of them on board. We already have several in this room. Um, and then together we can provide recommendations after that, but we can't do that until we get this information, right? Uh, and again, on the acceptable levels, as well as uh, kind of mandating or requesting regular testing, whether it be every batch, and I was talking to the research guys on break about this, you know, it's not economically feasible to test for everything for every batch. Okay, that's just the realistic part of it. But say every 10 batches, or every time you get a new load of fish meal in, or however it works, the logistics obviously would need to be worked out, but there should be some regular testing. And some of the things I talked about maybe aren't realistic, that won't really occur in zebra fish foods, but there certainly are a couple of them that could be of concern to us. Uh, and obviously continue research. All right? This can be a continuous process to find out what's going on and what are in our diets. Uh, I got a bunch of references. Uh, but I did start a list of about 25 somewhat common toxins that could occur aquaculture feeds in general that would give us a good start uh, in research. And that's all I have. Any questions? Questions for Mark? Just, I guess, a comment. I, I don't know about zebrafish, but um, I think it's been shown in rodents that the how toxic something is will also depend on the diet that's being fed. Because that will affect their health, maybe their immune system, maybe their gut microbes and leaky gut and all this. So I'm just, it's a, it makes this like a lot more complicated, unfortunately. But it's just, just thought I'd throw that out there. Obviously, we don't, we don't have a standard zebrafish diet. But if, it, if someone feeds Diet X and notices, I don't know, that arsenic does this, I'm not sure that that could be globally applied to the guy down the hall who's using a different zebrafish diet completely just because of what I've read on the roads. I just made a comment about arsenic. You know, arsenic in the water is probably inorganic. You can have high amounts of arsenic in seafoods, and that's organic, and that's very unavailable and not very toxic. Yeah. So you got to be careful what you do. You just say arsenic. Sure. Yeah, and I was talking in very broad terms. Same with chromium, right? Trivalent chromium is not toxic at all. It has to be extremely high concentrations. So hexavalent chromium is extremely toxic. So yeah, you have to get more defined than definitely what I was talking about, for sure. Any questions?